All right, welcome back to our teaching in the book of Genesis. Now, the last time we were here in chapter 48, we saw where Jacob was nearing his death and that he had gotten sick. And so the servants of Joseph called Joseph to his father and Joseph went along with his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, so that Jacob could bless Joseph as well as his sons before he died. And so basically in chapter 48, that's what we saw in the whole scheme of things, the blessing of Joseph. And that's the key thing to remember. It was Joseph's primary blessing because Jacob gave Joseph the birthright above all of his other brothers. And that's basically what we see here. The blessing of Joseph in that he blessed Joseph's sons as well. So the blessing that we see and with reference to that. He adopted, he took Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, for his own. And that's what Jacob did in that sense, okay? And basically, he simply told Joseph that any other son that he would have would be his own sons. And we know that Joseph didn't have any other sons, as recorded in, in Scripture. But nevertheless, he adopted those two sons. And we realize, we remember, that Manasseh was Joseph's firstborn son. Ephraim was his second born son in the land of Egypt. However, and, and we also remember that it was customary that the first born son should receive the blessing of the birthright. Now, this was done out of normal custom. And so when Joseph presented his sons to his fathers, he presented it so that his father could lay his hands upon them to bless them. He presented them in such a way that the firstborn son would be under the right hand of Jacob and the second son would be under the left hand because the right hand is the hand of power, the hand of dominance, the hand of primary blessing. OK, however, Jacob crossed his hands over so that he would bless the younger son, Ephraim, ahead of Manasseh. And he comforted Joseph and let him know. He said to him, Joseph, I know. I know my son because Joseph objected that the birthright of the blessing was given to the younger son. But Jacob comforted Joseph and told him, nevertheless, this is what should be done. That is, it is the will of God. And so that basically what was taking place in chapter 48, the blessings of Joseph and his sons. The same idea continues into chapter 49. With the exception, Joseph's sons, who already have been blessed, but now the concentration will be upon all of the sons of Joseph, the direct sons of Joseph, okay? Coming from Joseph's wife, uh, Leah and Rachel, and his two concubines, Zilpah and Bilhah. Now, we're not going to get into a lot of the details of the birth order because as Jacob begins to bless them, he doesn't bless them all in the order to which they were born. He basically blesses them as uh, the sons of Leah first, and then he deals with the handmaidens, that is the concubines later. And then finally, for last, he deals with the sons of Rachel. And we all remember that was his favorite wife, namely Joseph and Benjamin. OK, so he doesn't so much go into order, but it is the prophetic words that come from Joseph. So with this, as we get into chapter 49, we need to understand exactly. I'm sorry, the prophetic words of Jacob. We need to get into exactly what Jacob is doing. So Jacob here in chapter 49 is not in so much blessing his son, that is, with a patriarchal blessing. That is somewhat of an implied assumption, somewhat. But the nature of chapter 49 is prophetic as a whole. It speaks to, and as Jacob himself will say, what will become of his sons at later times, in the latter times, okay? So it is a prophetic word from Jacob concerning his sons. And, and, and that is not simply concerning his sons, but the tribal family of his sons. Because remember, these uh, men would develop, like Judah, Reuben, and all of these things. They're going to develop into specific numerous tribes each. So numerous tribes come from Judah, numerous tribes will come from uh, Reuben and so, and so and so on. So 
he will speak of what will happen to these tribal families in the future. What we will also note is in this prophetic notation that's given by Jacob concerning his sons, that is concerning those tribal families, we will note as Jacob will also prophesy how that the tribes will take on certain characteristics of their father. The tribe of Judah will take on certain characteristics. The tribe of Benjamin, the tribe of Simon, that they will take on certain characteristics of their tribal fathers. And we will also see a play upon the names of the tribal fathers when Jacob give these prophetic utterances. Okay. All right. Now, with all of that, let's just simply get into chapter 49. Then Jacob summoned his sons and said, assemble yourselves that I may tell you what, what will befall you in the days to come. Gather together and hear, O sons of Jacob, and listen to Israel, your father. And so now he begins to introduce, as we've already stated, the prophetic words and notice he said, what will become of you in days to come simply is in the future. So this not simply pertains, as we will see, this does not simply pertain to the sons only, but also their tribal families that will develop out from them. OK, and then notice how he gives reference to himself both as Jacob. That is the personal indication, Jacob your father. And then he also gives reference to himself according to the name to which God gave him Israel. And that is a more exalted name. He who wrestles with both God and men and succeeds and prevails. Okay. So he gives that tribal name, that specific ethnic identity to himself and all his people. Jacob and his sons. And so now he, uh, remember, he is approximately 147 years old at this time, basically. And we'll see at the end of the chapter, he is in his bed. He is in his bed and he's, uh, he is near unto death. So he is literally giving this prophetic utterance of blessings to his sons right before he dies. So he begins with his first and eldest son, Reuben. Verse number three, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might and the beginning of my strength, preeminent in dignity and preeminent in power, uncontrolled as water. You shall not have preeminence because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. Okay. So the first son he deals with is Reuben his firstborn son of his wife, Leah, the one he married first right, of Laban's two daughters. And it, it, he, he, he heaps on praises to Reuben because he was the firstborn son. And that's why you see he's talking about words like might and beginning of his strength and his preeminence. And so he builds up this exalted state concerning Reuben only to deflate the balloon right at the very end and test Reuben, even though you are preeminent in all of that. The idea is what you should have been as my firstborn son, what you should have been. He said, but nevertheless, you boil over like water. And this is when the NASB calls it uncontrolled like water. But the actual Hebrew says boiling over like water. And the idea is you are without restraint. Why was it? Why what was the indication of restraint? I believe it's Genesis chapter 35 when it says Reuben slept with his father's handmaiden, with his father's concubine. Remember, the concubine was almost like a wife, that, the idea of that. OK. And so Reuben committed adultery with one of Jacob's wives. And so therefore, he says, and it is because of this, you would not have the preeminence, which gives us the idea of the right of the firstborn. He was the firstborn son naturally customarily should have received the right of the firstborn, but this was taken away from him. And we know ultimately was given to Joseph, but we're not there yet. But that's the point that he is making concerning Reuben because of his uncontrolled nature. Jacob refused to give him the, the honor of being the preeminent firstborn son. Okay. So he continues on now to Simon and Levi. Simon and Levi are brothers. 
Their swords are implements of violence. Let my soul not enter into their counsel. Let my glory not be united with their assembly because in their anger, they slew men. Actually, in Hebrew, it says they slew a man. And in their self will, they lamed oxen. Actually, Hebrew again, they lamed an ox. <laughs> Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will disperse them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Beautiful prophecy. Okay. So now he gets into his two sons, Simon and Levi, and he talks about them having a violent nature. Notice he talks about the implements of war, that violent nature. And he says, let not my soul be in their counsel and my glory not be united with them. This is all in reference back to, I believe it's Genesis chapter 34 in the diner incident. Now you guys have to go and see the video if you cannot remember that, or if you haven't seen it thus far. But nevertheless, remember, Jacob, there was a daughter of Jacob, daughter also of his wife, Leah, who went among the Shechemites to kind of see what was going on in the town. And the prince of Shechem raped Dinah. And this became a bad incident. And these two sons of Jacob, namely Simon and Levi, when their father wanted to deal with the situation somewhat differently, they deceived, they deceived the Shechemite men of the town, deceived them into being circumcised on the third day when the, the pain of circumcision was really bad. They gathered, put a sword on their side, went into the town of Shechem, killed all of the men. And notice when they talked about this and they hamstrung the animals. Now, when that literally is to cut the tendons of the animals off on the back of the leg so they won't be useful for any work. Now, this is not wise. In other words, they were not simply acting in uh, uh, taking the animal. That would have been the smart and the wise thing. Take the animal and for yourself and then put the animal to work. They didn't do that. They simply acted in vengeance. And this is what Jacob is speaking towards. They're acting in simple vengeance. Killing men, hamstring, hamstringing animals is ridiculous. And what Joseph has said, their anger is just out of this world. And so therefore, Jacob, uh, he moves himself. He said, let me not be within their counsel. So he separates himself from them in this prophetic utterance. And also, too, as he looks further to the tribal and see, notice this is what you got to understand as well, because we see as and I probably should have mentioned it earlier as Jacob is blessing these 12 sons later on when the tribes, when the tribes of Israel being led by Moses. OK, right up to the point when they get ready to go into the promised land, when the pro when the tribes of Israel led by Moses get ready to go into the promised land. Moses also blesses the tribes. So as Jacob blesses his sons, Moses will later in a very similar way, bless the tribes that develop from these sons right before they begin to inherit the land of promise. All right. But nevertheless, back to the issue concerning Simon and Levi. And so therefore the judgment of Jacob concerning his son, Simon and Levi, all December, disseminated from the act of what I just told you about Genesis chapter 34, the, the Dinah incident was that they should be dispersed in Jacob. That is in the tribal allotment, the inheritance. Remember, because that's the whole point that the tribes are going to one day come back to the land and the tribes are going to be divided within the land. OK, and each of the tribe will have a specific portion of the land as an inheritance of Jacob. That's the idea. OK. But their tribal inheritance, they will not have any particular tribe. That's what Jacob meant when he said, let them be dispersed. Why? Because we find out Simon did not inherit a specific portion of land. His portion was actually distributed in the portion of Judah. So he had no particular specific allotment of land for the tribe of Simon. The prophecy of Jacob is fulfilled in that. And then also remember Levi too, as he's just talking about here, Levi had no tribal allotment. 
even though God remembered the tribe of Levi, because remember, he said that the tribe of Levi belonged to him and therefore God himself was their portion. OK, so he did not allot them, the tribe of Levi, a portion in the land. But nevertheless, he gave them 48 cities amongst their brothers amongst the allotment of the other tribes, but they themselves got no particular allotment of specific lands like their brothers. Therefore, or should we even say hence, is the fulfillment of the prophetic words of Jacob. Let them be scattered amongst their brothers, okay, in Israel. All right, so now let's move to Judah. And when he came to Judah, it was not only just simply specific, but it was it was somewhat lengthy. As we will see, the greater prophecies reside on the head of both Judah and Joseph for two different reasons now. But nevertheless, he speaks more about what will become of Judah and Joseph than any other other any of the other brothers. All right. So now let's talk about Judah in verse number eight. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down to you. Judah is a lion's whelp. From prey, my son, you have gone up. He couches. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion, who dares rouse him up? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet. That excites me. Until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. He ties his fold to the vine and his donkey's coat to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine. His robes are in the blood of grapes. His eyes are dull from wine, his teeth white from milk. Now that is just absolutely beautiful. And we don't want to hammer this one to death, but nevertheless, let's look at some of the specifics of what Jacob prophesied concerning Judah. Now we do remember that Judah was the fourth son of Leah. Okay. And his name means praise. And what we see in this prophecy is a play and we'll see it in other places as well, a play on the name of Judah. So notice he says when he starts the prophecy, Judah, your brother shall praise you. Judah means praise. His brother shall praise you. And what he begins to teach us is that will become a certain preeminence from Judah amongst his other brothers. And what you have to keep in mind is this. Remember now at this particular moment and for many years to come, Joseph and the tribe that come from Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh, but mainly Ephraim. But Joseph and Joseph's son, Ephraim, that tribe in particular, will have the preeminence. Even so, we don't want to get into it right now. We'll talk about when we get to Joseph. But nevertheless, what begins to ooze out even early ahead of time is that will be a rising in the tribe of Judah. Now, let's walk our way through this as we try to talk about who about whom, concerning whom, and what is all of this reference to, why Judah is beginning to emanate to the top of all the tribes where even all of the other sons of Jacob will begin to praise him. And so then he talks about the strength of Judah. What does he say? That's what he means when he says, your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. You see that right there? And then again, the strength and preeminence of Judah, your father's sons, that means all of them, including Joseph. Remember, go back again, Genesis chapter 37. It was Joseph who had the dream that all of his brothers were bowing down to him. Judah was bowing down to Joseph in Joseph's dreams. And we also saw Judah actually doing that when they came into Egypt. Go back and watch all of the videos that we did about the brothers coming into Egypt because of the famine. But notice here what we see with Judah arising to the preeminence of Judah. And now it's no longer Judah bowing down to Joseph, but it is now Joseph and the tribe of Ephraim, Manasseh, bowing down to Judah. What is going on and why is this the case? But let me go on. Then it continues to talk about Judah's strength and his power by comparing him to a young lion. And that's what it means when it says a lion's whelp. 
a young lion, a lion in his prime. Okay. And because he is such a strong, the idea being the strength and power of the tribe of Judah, he begins to say as a lion, who in the world going to fool with him when he crouches, who's going to bother him, disturb his rest. <laughs> And so and he uses these types of uh, 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 adjectives to talk about Judah. And then he gets to verse number 10 as he begins to deal with the issue of royalty, the issue of kingship. And so notice again, remember, as we compare again, Joseph being the one of royalty even as we speak now, present tense from Jacob. Okay. Because remember Joseph was second in second to the authority of the Pharaoh, but he is in Egypt. He is not ruling over all of the peoples plural, nor is he ruling over the promised land in Israel, which it will become right. But notice what's going on. Now we see now kingship, rulership, authority concerning Judah. And that is more specific one that should come from Judah. But we'll talk about that as we work through this text. Verse number 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Notice once the, the power gets into his hands, the scepter of rulership, it shall remain. The divine authority will remain with Judah. And just to simply make a long story short, we saw this in second Samuel. When we, we, when God had chosen David over Saul, God chose David, King David over King Saul. He did, he displaced, he got rid of the dynastic rule of Saul's family from the tribe of Benjamin, but we don't want to get into all of that. And God himself established David and David's family. And that's the prophecy that we see in second Samuel chapter seven, when God promises to build David an eternal house and to establish an eternal king from the house of David. And God himself legitimized that from David and only from the family of David would be a king over Israel, which will end up being the king over united Israel. Okay. That's the idea over God's people. And notice David was a descendant. We see from the book of Ruth, I believe yeah, Ruth, <laughs> Ruth, David descends from the tribe of Judah. So therefore see this whole issue of from him shall be the scepter and the rule. And even so, as we push it on through, and you guys probably know this anyway, that it is Jesus himself, Jesus, the Messiah, son of God, who is descended from David. Remember how you see many times in the new Testament, when they would give reference to Jesus, they would call him son of David. That is a reference to the messianic king. Okay. And so this is what we begin to allude to right now. We're going to hit it directly as we get into this point, but this is what Jacob is now alluding to when he talks about the scepter that is him and the ruler staff from between his feet, the rule, the rulership kingship belongs permanently with Judah. And then he says at the very end of verse number 10 until Shiloh comes. And that's kind of can be kind of confusing because it uses a proper name Shiloh. But actually the probably the best interpretation, even as we see in the Septuagint, the best interpretation is the scepter shall remain with him until he comes to whom it belongs. And that's the idea that is being effervesced in the word Shiloh. The scepter, the reign of power shall remain with him until it shall remain with Judah, tribe of Judah, until it gets to one specifically, specifically to whom this authority to rule over until he comes then it lands properly with him. And so to cut all of it short so you guys could get it is that it continues with the tribe of Judah up until right, until the rightful heir and the rightful heir of this is the Messiah, 
the Messiah. And that's even what the Jews understood, that this was a messianic prophecy. It looked forward to the Messiah. And when he would come, the reign would be his. And we know that the Messiah has come, Jesus of Nazareth. And therefore it will be, notice I used a future tense verb, it will be in the second advent that is the return of Jesus to this earth, that he will exercise the rule as it is spoken of here in Genesis chapter 49. But anyway, let's continue. Verse number 11. So now it talks about, and it could kind of be confusing when you look at verse number 11, talking about his foal to the vine, donkey's coat to the choice vine. All of this, these verses simply talking about is when the one who comes to whom it belongs, what it power, scepter, authority, reign over all things. When he comes, it speaks of his kingdom. It speaks of his reign. It speaks of the abundance in his reign. In other words, as, as we see in the prophets all the time in the book of Isaiah, what is it, chapter 65, and on and on and on in the book of Ezekiel, it talks about when the Messiah will come, the prosperity the abundance, the peace, and the glory of the Messiah's reign. Even the Apostle Paul talks about it, okay? So all he's talking about here in Genesis verse number 49 and 11 is the prosperity. It will be fruitfulness so abundant that you will literally take your foal or your donkey you, you don't have time to a post. That's what you would normally time to something like a post. The fruit everywhere. You just time to a fruit vine. Why? Why a fruit vine? He said, man, they are everywhere. So the idea is abundance and prosperity. And he continues this concept of prosperity. Note, he washes his garments in the wine. Now here he simply again noted why garments washed in the wine, robes washed in the blood of grapes. Here, the idea once again is abundance, wine in abundance, grapes in abundance. And he continues on with this idea in abundance when he says his eyes are dull from wine. Actually, dull is not the proper sense of the words that I use here. His eyes are like the color color of wine. Once who has been drinking wine, not to drunkenness, not to drunkenness. Can you imagine Jesus drunk with wine? That's ridiculous. But nevertheless, abundance of fruit, dull of wine. And notice teeth white from milk speaks once again of one abundance. So that's the whole point of all of this section here. Donkeys tied to vine, folds to, to uh, vines and, and wines and all of this stuff is just speaking of the abundance. When the one who is to come does come to whom the scepter rightfully belongs. His rule shall be glorious, abundant, and prosperous above anything this world has ever seen when Jesus comes back. And basically that's the idea. Also, there is an implied reference here. And notice I'm using, not light, I'm using it in a light sense when it talks about he washes his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of grapes. OK, now here is a light, a light prophetic utterance that probably is hinting to what Isaiah said. I believe it's Isaiah 63 when he uh, uh, 34, when he talks at 63, it's a combination of both 34 and 63. When he talks about the return of Jesus and we don't want to get into all of that, but we understand from Revelation 19, that's the end of Revelation 19 and Revelation chapter 20. When Jesus does return in the battle of Armageddon, he returns in war. And when he returns into the hills of Bolthra, when he returns into that region, he makes war with his adversaries and he destroys thousands and thousands. He kills thousands and thousands, even with the sword that comes from his mouth. And when Jesus actually appears, his clothes are blood soaked. And they say to him, 
Where have you been? What have you been doing? Your clothes are so soaked with blood. You look like someone who has been in the trough, or in the wine press, threshing out the, the uh, grapes. And that's what happened when you get into the wine press and squishing out the grapes in the wine press and make the, the, the juice from the grapes drip from the wine press and all of that juice hit your clothes. And so your clothes look soaked with the, with the, uh, the, the wine, the wine, the, the grapes, the color and things of that nature. And Jesus has been in war and battle. And he looks like he's been in there. And so Jesus simply says, I have been tre uh, treading the wine press of God and I've been treading on men and that's blood on my robe. And I did this walk all by myself. But anyway, so there is an illusion that you also see here when it gives the indication of garments in wine and blood of grace. OK. All right. Enough of that. But that's concerning Judah, an extensive Beautiful prophecy that speaks of the Messiah, letting us know that what, even though at present time and even for many years to come, the birthright, the preeminence is with Joseph. The royalty is with Joseph, even Ephraim. OK, but there will come a time when Judah will eclipse his brothers. And we saw that coming in David in King David and David's family became the family of Kings. And it is from the family of Kings of David, who is of the tribe of Judah, that Jesus, the Messiah himself come and he will have rule over all of these things. Okay. All right. But notice, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It also said, let's go back to verse number 10. Cause we need to see this too concerning Judah and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. A meme that is plural. That is, once again, from Judah, one will come, he will have the tribal, he will rule, but not only will he rule over the tribe of Israel, he will rule over all the peoples of the world. And that's what it means at the end of verse number 10, the obedience of the people. It speaks of worldwide rulership that comes from Judah. We know it is Jesus, okay? And all the peoples of the world. And we know this through all the words of the prophets, prophet Zechariah, Isaiah, and it goes on and on and on. Jeremiah, they all talk about the Messiah in some way or another. And how, especially in the book of Zechariah, how he comes and rules over all the world. Okay, now let's move on and get to Zebulun. Verse number 13. Zebulun will dwell at the seashore and he will be a haven for ships and his flank shall be toward Sidon. Now it talks about Zebulun, um, an, another son of Leah, but nevertheless, it talks about him dwelling at the seashore. Okay. Now, even though, even though the tribe of Zebulun was landlocked, that is when Joshua gave them their allotment. Okay. They were still near enough to the seashore. They only separated by one other tribe to benefit by the commerce of the sea. So what the idea of uh, Jacob is prophesying is one of commercial activity and commercial productiveness. And so therefore we see Zebulun as being commercially productive. And that's the idea that he's talking about here. Issachar, verse number 14. Issachar is a strong donkey lying down between the sheepfolds. When he saw the resting place was good and that the land was pleasant, he bowed his shoulder to bear burdens and became a slave at forced labor. <laughs> he became a slave at first labor. Okay, what is he talking about with Issachar? He's talking about the strength of the tribe of Issachar in the sense of labor. That means they are hard working people, but hard working at the sense of manual labor. It is not a tribe of great ambition. No notable people really came from Issachar. Not, not a lot that I can even remember. I can recall from the tribe of Issachar. Okay. But they were manually, they would work hard. They had no great ambition, but there was a sense of laziness, laziness with respect to ambition. With, with what respect to ambition. That's why he said when he saw the resting place was good, a place where they would have their allotment, 
There is no big deal out of it. What happened? We see that when Issachar came into the place, they would sometimes allow themselves instead of fighting for their portion of the land, they would will it, they would willingly submit to the leadership or rule of others over them. Even the Canaanites that's later on in the book of judges, but even the rule of the Canaanites over them, they would just be like no resistant so that they could simply enjoy the land. And that's why he speak of, they became a slave at forced labor, the beauty of the prophetic word of God. So they didn't fight. They didn't fight. They just simply worked hard on the land without great ambition. Okay. And if somebody else came and tried to take it over, they pretty much submitted to that. It's a car. Now let's move to Dan. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent in the way a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heel so that his rider falls backward for your salvation. I wait. Oh Lord. I like when he did that. I like, but let's talk about that. I like when he let's, remember now, this is Jacob talking right as he is uh, speaking prophetically blessing his son. But notice how he said, I wait for your salvation. What the world is going on. He just interrupted the prophetic words concerning Dan. Why? Let's talk about it. Dan shall judge his people. Again, we have a play on the name. Dan, remember, Dan means to judge, okay? And, and so therefore he says, Dan shall judge his people. And this was the mindset of God to give Dan a beautiful place among his brethren as a judge, all right? But Dan failed this. And so therefore he called Dan. Dan also had, let me deal with this other part too. He called him a serpent in the way, a serpent that strikes the heel of the horse as the ride is passing by, things of that nature. He spoke also too of Dan's, uh, it's like guerrilla warfare, okay? That, I think that's the best way to put it. And how he was striking, and so he, he was a good fighter. And his fighting is like guerrilla warfare. He slip up on you and attack you and things of that nature. I think that's somewhere in the book of Judges, wait, chapter 18. Don't hold me to it. But anyway, we saw that with the tribe of Dan acting in such a manner, okay? But nevertheless, notice he says too, okay, they were good in warfare. Then comes that interjection. Oh Lord, for your salvation, I wait, oh Lord, okay? He begins to look, he's waiting. He, it's an exclamation. Their ears pathos, seemingly a well of emotion that comes up in Jacob as he say, as he looks forward to the coming of the Lord until the Lord should actually bring in and give Israel true rest. That's why he says salvation. I wait for your salvation when God will come and put an end to all these things and bring in the fullness of the salvation of God, which we already know comes with the return of Jesus Christ, the setting up of the millennial kingdom. Okay. But nevertheless, what is going on with respect to Dan? I do believe there is a tie because what we also see with Dan is even though God had desired for Dan to be a judge among the other tribes of his own people, Dan failed this greatly. And Dan actually became one of the very first tribes to engage and adopt idolatry. Dan engaged and adopt idolatry. Okay. And so it seems like it is from this prophetic insight that moves Jacob to plead and wait for the time when all of this is done away with all of the failures of peoples are done away with and God do what set up his kingdom. The Messiah should come. Oh Lord, how I wait for your salvation. Maybe he had some sort of an insight to that. Can't be certain, but that's what he said. All right, let's move on now to Gad. As for Gad, Raiders shall raid him, but he will raid at their heels. Didn't say much about Gad, except for he will be raided by other tribes. And, other, and we're not talking about so much the tribes of his brothers. Normally, normally this means by other uh, uh, heathen tribes, the Canaanites, things of that nature. But nevertheless, it just simply says Gad will strike back. He will raid them in return. Okay. Asher, as for Asher, his food shall be rich and he will yield royal dainties. Okay. And now it talks about Asher 
and how that the land of Asher, the land in which you have, would be a very prosperous land and that from the land of Asher would come rich foods fit for a king. And that's what he's saying. Naphtali is a doe let loose. He gives beautiful words. And so here with, with the tribe of Naphtali, which they were basically a mountainous tribe, he speaks of the tribe of Naphtali as a doe running wild. <laughs> and that's not bad, running wild in the mountains. That just simply means a doe that is running free. And from the tribe of Naphtali, this is the idea, a mountainous free dwelling people. OK. And also he speaks of a sense of wisdom coming from the tribe of Naphtali when he says what he gives beautiful words. Twenty two. Now we get to the blessing or the prophetic utterance concerning Joseph. And like we said concerning Judah, remember we told you earlier, Judah and Joseph, these were the lengthiest uh, blessing slash prophecies that we do have. And we also recall it is to Joseph that was given the birthright. We saw that as early as Genesis chapter 37. We saw that even again, once again, in the previous chapter in chapter 48, the concerning the blessing of Joseph as well as his sons. OK, and so we will see somewhat a regurgitation of this idea of the blessing of the birthright, but also to the preeminence of Joseph. And we know that Joseph already had the preeminence. Why? Once again, reminder, Joseph is second in authority over all of Egypt. Okay. And so with this, at, with this idea and the blessing of the birthright and Joseph being the favorite son, favorite son of Joseph, of Jacob's wife, favorite wife, Rachel, the abundance of blessing that he heaps upon Joseph as well as acquiring, I'm sorry, bequeathing, that is to give all of his uh, property over to Joseph. Because remember, the one who is given the birthright is given a double portion even above his brothers. So Jacob gives the greatness of his wealth to Joseph. And that's what we're going to see here. Okay. Uh, verse number, where are we guys? 22. Joseph is a fruitful bow. A fruitful bow by a spring. Its branches run over a wall. The archers bitterly attacked him and shot at him and harassed him. But his bow remained firm. His arms were agile from the hands of the mighty one of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. From the God of your father who helps you and by the almighty who blesses you with blessings of heaven above. You see how rich that is? With blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings in the breast and of the womb, the blessings of your father have surpassed the blessings of my ancestors and to the utmost abound up the everlasting hills. May they be on the head of Joseph and on the crown of the head of the one distinguished amongst his brothers. Now, man, now that's a blessing. The blessing, and here's what you have to understand, temporally, temporally for the moment, just, just remember everything I said, compared over to Judah, Judah will rise above. Judah will rise above, but for the time now, Joseph is, is just, he lavished blessings on Joseph. Okay. So now let's just look at the prophetic words concerning him. When he calls him a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow, a fruitful bow, just simply considered like a vine, a, a very beautiful, growing, luscious vine, fruitful. All right. By a spring, not simply by in the ground, but by a spring of water itself, constantly nourished. Again, talking about what? The blessings of fruitfulness. And also, too, when he talks about fruitful, it's a play on Joseph's son's name, Ephraim, to whom Jacob blessed as the firstborn son of Joseph. He gave him the right of the firstborn. Ephraim means fruitful. OK, so there's a play on Joseph's son's name here. All right. But anyway, so he talks about that that fruitfulness of Joseph. Verse number 23 and 24, when he talks about the archers that attacked him and shot at him and, and, and then his bow remained firm. This is in remembrance to how his brothers 
envied and mistreated him. And we all want, we don't want to rehearse all of that from Genesis chapter 37, how his brothers hated him because Joseph was number one, beloved of his father, given the preeminence by his father, that is the birthright, coat of many colors. Joseph having the dream, they called him the dreamer, things of that nature. His brothers hated him. They mistreated him. They put him in the well. They sold him as a slave. All right. These are the, these are the arrows that were shot against Joseph. But nevertheless, what happened? His bow remained firm. Joseph remained faithful in all the things that happened to him from the time that his brothers mistreated him from the time that he ended up going into the household of Potiphar. And even when Potiphar's wife lied on Joseph and Joseph, uh, he, he suffered the indignation of being put in jail by Potiphar, even though we understand that I believe that Potiphar was trying to go as easy as he could on Joseph and save faith. But nevertheless, he ended up in prison. All of that he went through. His bow remained firm. Joseph remained faithful to God. And that's the idea that is being coming up here. Okay. So, and that's, so he remained firm. His arms were agile. That's the idea. And then it says, it talks about the blessings of Joseph. That is the source of the blessing. And then it gives this multi name uh, reference to God, to Jacob's God. And it calls him what? The God of your father. That is Jacob simply saying from my God, the one who helped you, Joseph, in all your adversity from your brother, from Potter's wife, from Potter, blah, 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 in the jail. The one who helped you to bring you to the point to where you are now, ruler in Egypt. Then he calls him once the reference again, another name for God, almighty, not El Shaddai here, but simply Shaddai, Almighty who blessed you. The reason making Joseph re remember, making him to understand the reason why you are where you are, the reason why you were able to withstand and to be who you are. It is not due to you. It is not due to your ability. It is not due to your cunningness nor your wisdom. It is because God help you. And we always need to remember that whatever we have, it is from the Lord. And it is because it is the decree of God for our personal life and not because anything that is a result of our pride. It is God who has chosen us to be and to play the role that we play. And that's what it means. And I, I love, I feel like preaching that it is the almighty who has blessed you and given you these blessings of heaven above where the, his exalted position, the riches that he now has even in Egypt and that his tribal family will have, namely even the tribe of Ephraim. But anyway, let's continue on. And he talks about the abundance of blessings and notice we see the superlatives that are being used here. Blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep of the, uh, of the sea, blessings of the breast and the womb, <laughs> heaven above deeply. I mean, blessing every which way you turn blessed, blessed, blessed. And then he talks about blessing with the fruit of the womb, because we know that the tribe of Ephraim became a very uh, numerous tribe when the, when the, by the time that Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt and even into the second generation. And they began to be placed in the land of, uh, of their allotment during the time of Joshua. But we ain't gonna get into all of that. And so he talks about again, fine, let's, let's wrap it up. Talks about the blessings of your father. That's when I was telling you guys about the blessings, the material blessings of Jacob himself. He now bequeaths it to his son, Joseph. These with that, which is mine is yours as the right of the firstborn. And we understand the firstborn gets a greater portion than the portion of his brothers. He even iterated that earlier concerning his blessing of Joseph. He said, I give you a portion above your brother. And so he talks about the, the blessing that surpasses his ancestors. And that is the blessing of Jacob himself surpassed the blessing of Abraham, his grandfather. It surpassed the blessing of his father, Isaac. And even so, the blessing of Joseph surpasses all of them, all of them. OK, and that's the idea. The blessing of my ancestors, the utmost of their, and then he said, may they be on the head of Joseph. Transference, birthright, 
in the sight of all the rest of his brothers who are standing there at the bed listening to these things. The blessing of birthright, the portion given to Joseph and the crown of the head. And notice crown of the head, the head of the family. OK. And remember, again, let it keep bouncing in your mind, even though Joseph has the crown over the brothers themselves, over the rest of the brothers. One day that crown, that scepter, that power, that regal authority will be given to Judah and one of his sons. Specifically, we know Jesus of Nazareth. OK. But nevertheless, crown of the head. OK. Being the leader. And then one distinguished amongst his brothers. And we already know Joseph was clearly distinguished of his brothers all the way starting again, once again, from Genesis 37. All right, Joseph. Now, Benjamin, and let's wrap up the final blessing of Joseph's younger brother. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours the prey. In the evening, he divides the, sp the spoil. And so he, his sp prophetic word concerning Benjamin is he speaks of him as a wolf. And that simply is Benjamin's tribe is a, a warlike tribe. They, 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 they good at fighting and, and good at destroying things and taking things for prey. And that's why he gives them the sense of a wolf who takes the prey, okay, and divides the four. So they're good at fighting. Now, let's wrap up the blessing of 49. All these things, all these are the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is what their father said to them when he blessed them. He blessed them, everyone, with the blessing appropriate to him. Then he charged them and said to them, I'm about to be gathered to my people. Bury me with my fathers in the cave that is in the field of Ephron the Hittite, in the cave that is in the field of Machpelah, which is before Mamre, in the land of Canaan, which Abraham bought along with the field from Ephron the Hittite for a burial site. There they buried Abraham and his wife, Sarah. There they buried Isaac and his wife, Rebekah. And there I buried Leah. The field and the cave that is in it purchased from the sons of Heth. When Jacob finished charging his sons, he drew his feet into the bed and breathed his last and was gathered to his people. Boy, that is so beautiful. But anyway, so now let's talk to it. So now he says, these are, verse number 28, these are the blessings, the prophetic utterances with which he blessed his 12 sons. And notice he calls them not simply sons, but what? Tribes of Israel. That is, these prophetic utterances speak not only specifically to the sons alone, but their descendants that should come from them that shall be the tribes that will constitute the land of Canaan. OK, and this is the blessings that he gave to them individually. And so finally, like he did with Joseph. And we remember he did that earlier with Joseph when he told Joseph, put your hand up under my thigh and swear to me, do not bury me in Egypt, but bury me in the land of my fathers. OK. He makes his sons, all of them, all 12 of them, he tells them to bury him in the promised land, take him back. And he gives specific instructions to the specific place, to the cave. And we've talked about this a number of times that Abraham purchased as a burial place for his wife, Sarah. It was the cave of Machpelah purchased from the sons of Heth. OK, sons of Heth. And it was in this particular cave, he says, you bury me there, the cave of my ancestors. Now, let me go to this point here. So he made that clear to them. But verse number 31, and I really like verse number 31. Notice he begins to enumerate who was buried in the cave. He said, what? Abraham's wife, Sarah, was buried in that cave. Abraham himself was buried in that cave, the patriarch and his wife. Then he says, what? Isaac and his wife, Rebecca, the second patriarch and his wife were buried in that cave. And then he said, and also in the cave of the patriarchs, I buried Leah. Now, even though there is no account earlier in Genesis of this, of Leah's death and her being buried there, 
Here we have the record of, of Jacob telling us what happened, not so much as what happened with Leah, but where he buried her in the cave of the patriarchs. He buried there Leah, and now we have Jacob himself requesting to be buried in the cave of Machpelah. So we have what? I'm gonna get to it. I know it's long, but I'm gonna get to it. Abraham and his principal wife. I feel like, I almost feel like hooping and preaching. I almost feel like doing it. Abraham is principal wife. Okay. Why do I say principal wife? Because we know Abraham had another wife, Keturah, Genesis chapter 25. But Keturah was not buried in the cave of Machpelah, but Sarah was. Sarah was the wife of uh, the principal wife of Abraham. And when I say principal, there gives, there is a more prophetic sense to this, a more prophetic sense to this that I don't even want to get into. And I, and I, I think I'm almost speaking even outside of my own mindset in that the one through whom God would use in a specific way, but let's just go on with it. Sarah is buried, is buried there with Abraham. Then we have what? Rebecca and Isaac. And we also, and now we don't have the same sense of the thing with Isaac, with other wives and things of that nature. But nevertheless, Isaac and his principal wife, we know from whom Isaac and Rebecca came Jacob himself, who is that son of promise. What did I just say? Son of promise. That's what I mean when I talk about that prophetic thing, speaking even further into the future. And then what? Leah was built. And that's where I want to come to right now. We remember as early as what Genesis chapter 29, when Jacob first laid eyes on Rachel, Rachel was the one who was pretty and beautiful of form. Rachel was the one whom he loved the most. We know that it was uh, her father, Laban. He had two daughters, Leah and Rachel. Laban tricked Jacob and gave him Leah instead of Rachel to marry. That was the first time. Okay. And Leah, what the Bible called her, had weak eyes. She wasn't as pretty as Rachel was, but nevertheless, boy, I feel like preaching, but nevertheless, it was Laban to whom, uh, uh, um, it was Laban who gave, he tricked him and gave him Leah as the first wife. But later on, we know he gave him the wife, Rachel. And the Bible said Leah was was unloved. Jacob didn't love Leah like he loved Rachel. He loved Rachel the most. He loved Rachel's children the most. Joseph was the firstborn son of Rachel. Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob's favorite wife. But when it came time to be buried, and here's what I want to talk about. Notice who is in the cave of the patriarchs. Leah was buried along the way, on their way to Ephrath, on their way to Bethlehem, I'm sorry, Rachel was buried there and Rachel was buried on the way into Bethlehem. She was buried. She was not buried in the cave of Machpelah. She was not buried in the caves of the patriarchs. She is not counted principal in the same way that Leah has now been counted because why? Look who is in the cave, Leah. Leah, she now has a place with Jacob that she, in death that she never had in life. She will be buried alongside her husband, Leah. And what does it say? Because we know what, Listen, let, me, let me help you out. It is Leah who is the mother of Jacob's fourth born son. That is Judah. And who, what did the Bible just say about Judah? Jacob just prophesied it. It is from him whom Shiloh will come, the one to whom the scepter of power belongs. So therefore, is it not right? Is it not beautiful for Leah to be in the cave of the patriarchs themselves? So you me tell me, it's a beautiful thing. I don't care what Jacob wanted. It is never what men want. It is the decision of God and God alone. God chose Leah. It wasn't just simply Laban tricking Jacob. God chose Leah and therefore she is honored even here to be in the cave of Machpelah. Now that's something to think about. But anyway, so now let's finish it. So then finally when Jacob finished talking, telling him the instruction on where to bury his body, the Bible said he drew his foot into the bed he, and he bowed his head and he died. He died. So he blessed. The last thing he did was to bless his sons. 
and he closed his eyes in death. I myself, I have four sons and I do hope that God gives me this wonderful privilege at the moment of my death to be able to bless my sons when I pass. All right, guys, thanks for joining me on that one. I love it, I love it, I truly love the prophecy of Jacob and his sons. We'll catch you next time as we conclude in Genesis chapter 50 and we bring to a close the wonderful book of Genesis.